I was around 11 years old, my family and I had just moved from Tennessee to Texas as my dad was working out a deal for a new job. But my brother and I, we were homeschooled at this time, which meant that we could move in with my aunt and uncle with no problems relating to finding a house in a good school district. But my family was pretty close back then too and all of the cousins got along just fine. But we loved to do everything together, especially me and my female cousin Peyton. But my immediate family, meaning me, my mum, my dad, brother and sister, had spent the past seven years without a jack-in-the-box. Yeah, it was terrible too, but we were all born in Texas so we loved it, but living in Tennessee we had to go without it. Now, a particular night however, all of our parents had gone out to dinner and told us very specifically to not leave the house. Well, we were to lock the doors after they left and play games or something. You might be thinking that this is now becoming about an intruder, but I promise that this is ten times more bizarre and I still have no idea what happened. So after the parents left, all of the cousins got together and we decided that we wanted ice cream and candy. Not that this is that important, but I remember Ben and Jerry's being the main target. So we devised a foolproof plan to sneak out and acquire the goods. Well, we thought it was foolproof. My older sister, the driver, my cousin Peyton and I, we all loaded into my dad's car that was left at the house and off we were to get some food. We shouldn't have even left to be honest, but uh, kids do stupid things, right? So on our way to the store, we get the snacks. We decided that Jack in the Box sounded much better than some sugar, so off we went. And as we pulled up to the drive through we decided that it was about three cars too long and that we should just go inside and order instead. And that was a big mistake. When we stepped inside, there was one girl in this restaurant. She was short with a small figure and wearing winter clothes, so she looked completely ready for an outing. The girl asked the cashier for a water cup and... The girl asked the cashier for a water cup and proceeded to fill it with either Sprite or some other soda. I remember the guy at the register sort of looking at her extremely confused, but it was a late night and he couldn't care less, I'm sure. When she finished filling up her cup, she drank it extremely quickly and started to turn around to throw the cup out and leave. Now, I have an awful memory, but I will never forget her eyes being wide open as if she had seen something scary. At this point, we had been standing at the entrance doors for the entire interaction, just sort of watching, for whatever reason. We were just nosy kids, I suppose, but as she was walking out, I looked down and noticed that she was gripping a, a large butcher's knife. And you guys, this thing was huge. Immediately, my heart dropped and I heard my cousin begin to freak out. So, this knife-wielding girl leaves the restaurant and... But we go on to order our food, talking about it to the guy at the register and kind of laughing it off, but also still very curious, confused, and a little bit scared, I admit. As we leave with our food, we see the girl crossing the street to the CVS. Now, it was kind of late, but there was still a good number of cars driving on this road at the time. She didn't look either way, just crossed with ease as if invincible but we brushed it off and assumed that she was just doing her own thing. After a while of eating some tacos and talking about how fun it was to be out without permission, we saw maybe a dozen police lights start to enter the CVS parking lot. Like I said before, we were pretty nosy kids, so we decided to do what any nosy person would do and investigate. We drove over to the CVS and we were stopped in the parking lot by an officer to be asked a couple of questions. My memory gets a bit hazy here, but I do remember that it was a problem because my cousin and I were both minors at the time technically, or something about being minors, and involving ourselves with the police was actually a problem. So they asked us a couple of questions, and I just remember my sister and cousin explaining that we had seen a girl wielding a knife in the jack-in-the-box across the street. But with that, they eventually let us go, and we hurried back home. A little bit later that night, when everyone, parents included, were winding down for bed, our mothers called the three of us into one of the rooms in the house to talk about something. I don't think any of us really realized that they knew about what we did. 
They sat us down and calmly asked us what we did tonight, and I think we lied, but I don't quite remember. Either way, it was useless because somehow they knew everything, and even what we didn't know. You see, our mums told us that someone on Facebook had posted about three heroic girls that knew information about the girl in the situation that I'm about to explain to you. Heroic? Hardly. All we did was answer a few questions. A nosy? That's probably more like it. But they told us that this girl had entered the CVS and grabbed a woman by the hair and proceeded to hold the knife to her throat for like several minutes before the police could show up. Apparently, people had tried to get her off, but it was useless. After all, she did have that weapon. The girl was apparently screaming and just being very aggressive, but as that was many years ago, I don't really remember too many details. All I do remember is that it was a really scary situation for a lot of people. And to this day, I... I often think about how easily that could have been one of us with a knife to the throat in Fort Worth Jack in the Box, or how easily someone could have been hurt, or maybe even worse. Anyway, I'm just glad that everyone got out of that situation unscathed, and I'm really glad that nothing happened to us that night. So I used to order pizza a lot. I mean, I love pizza. Who doesn't, right? Well, my local pizza place, we got a new driver who just oh, way, way overstepped the boundaries of what's acceptable. I mean, he tried to force his way into my home at one point to share dinner with me. And just really general creepy behavior. So I stopped ordering pizza altogether. Well, really, I personally never noticed anything. I have a security system, so I figured all was well, and I never check it, really. But about two months after the pizza incident, I hear scratching at the side of my home. I figure that it must be an animal. I do live outside the city, so there are animals here looking for a place to nest. There was also a big fresh coating of snow, and it was cold, so I can only imagine that something is looking for a way in to be warm. So I do what I usually do, I let my dog out, he's huge, like 120 pounds, King Shepherd and Marima, and he just bolts out the door. Again, not totally unlike him when there's an animal outside, but about 15 to 20 seconds later I hear screaming and swearing, then screaming in pain and terror. I scream for my dog to come back, and he does, he's a good boy, and I call the police. Well, they do a search of the outside of the house, and what they find is blood, like lots of blood, and pry marks at the side of my house. We go through the footage of my security system, and sure enough, there's a person who's trying to force the window open. My dog charges him and tears at his butt and gets his leg pretty bad too, until I call him back and he gets up and limps off of my property. Well, at the front of my property, the entrance to my drive, I also have a camera. It's pretty well hidden. And I get the guy going to his car and also his plates. And the cops take it and they go to the hospital. Apparently, there was a lot of blood. And whoever this person was, they were definitely going to need medical attention. Well, the police eventually find this guy. And apparently he says to them, Oh, I was just trying to surprise my girlfriend and I fell. But... I'm a widow, and honestly, I never plan on dating again for the rest of my life. But they came back to my house, tell me this, and show me a picture. And sure enough, it was the pizza guy. The most disturbing thing is that they eventually searched his car, and they found rope, duct tape, a camera, and a knife in his car. I hear a lot of stories on here about stalkers and whatnot, and a lot of people blow it off as not a big deal, but really, you should take it seriously because you never know who might be watching. So a few years ago, I, a female and 17 at the time, would attend community college at the outskirts of my hometown. 
I would take an hour and a half long bus drive because both my parents worked. And my other siblings were too young to drive me, so it's what I had to do. The outskirts of my town, despite being the literal outskirts, are more populated than you'd expect. With strip malls and apartment buildings, pretty much everything you need is there. The bus would drop me off about maybe four blocks from my university, which isn't too far. And I always enjoyed those few minutes. It gave me time to sort of disassociate. Anyway... This one time, I left my phone at the library, like a true idiot. Using my brother's phone, I called a friend who worked at the school library during the late evening shift, 7 to 9, and he said that he'd bring my phone to me, but he lived closer to the college than I did, so I told him that I would just meet him at his shift and I would pick it up myself. He said okay to this, and I boarded the bus at around 6. Now, I get off the bus at my usual spot, and the place looked... Well, deserted. I'd never been there that late at night before, and maybe it was because it was a, a weekday that people were home, or... Uh, I don't know, but... I had my brother's phone in my pocket, and I just clutched it tighter and tighter, picked up my speed until I was practically jogging. I'm nearing to a corner when a flash of light goes off to my right. But there, in the shadows, is a really slimy, grimy-looking man. He's balding with a tourist shirt unbuttoned halfway, showing off his chest hair. And he was wearing sunglasses at night, was wearing some sort of gold jewelry, and was probably borderline morbidly obese. Just picture the word sleazy as a person, and you probably have it. But most importantly, he had just taken a picture of me. In the instant that I saw the flash go off, I knew it was coming from his phone too. Now, I think it's important to understand our positioning for this. So, he was pressed against a building to my right, right at the corner I had to turn. I was about 10 feet away from him, and to my left, on the same side of the street, was a car with blacked out windows, no license plates, directly across the sidewalk from this man. The car was parked with the driver's seat facing me, so that meant that it was on the wrong side of the road, because Americans drive on the right side, as opposed to the left. Now, I had slowed down at that point as I began to debate my next move. Cross the street and continue walking, make a break for the school, turn 180 and leave my phone at the library, or approach the potentially dangerous man. In the end, I probably did the stupidest thing possible and approached the man. I'm not going to sit here and give you like street advice or anything, but maybe just don't do what I did. I'm alive, but I was definitely lucky. Anyway, I demanded to know what he was doing, and he looked sort of taken aback by that question. I could see his brain sort of short-circuiting because this tiny young girl was red in the face, demanding to know what he was doing. He eventually sputtered out about how he was just standing here. I said, No, I saw you take that picture of me, man. And his face immediately fell. He started saying, no he didn't, he hadn't done that, why would he want a picture of me? I had imagined it. At this, I asked to see his gallery, which I know, is extremely risky, because who knows what I would have seen and getting close to the guy like that was crazy, but it's what I did. He slowly pulls up his gallery and as it's opening, I see a blurry picture of me in the distance. To be honest, I didn't think that I would get that far. Granted, I had been running on adrenaline during our whole interaction, but this really made me pause. I told him to instantly delete it, but then a door slammed shut, and I just knew that it was that parked car across the road. My brain cleared up very quickly, and I hightailed it quickly to the school, but as I was running, I could hear a single pair of footsteps behind me, I sure as heck wasn't about to turn around though and check out who it was, but the car started at some point. They would have had to have done a U-turn on a relatively narrow street just to be able to follow me, and to be honest, I think that's what saved my life that night. The fact that the car was parked facing the wrong direction. Eventually I reached the school out of breath and in tears. My friend opened the building for me and I was crying, explaining what happened. He locked us in while we waited for the police, but 
Unfortunately, the sleazy guy and his buddy, they were never found. Anyway, my mum had gotten out of work by that point and I called her to ask to pick me up. We waited with my friend until the end of his shift and drove him home too. Needless to say, these days I carry mace with me everywhere I go now and am yet to find a police report stating a guy matching his description had been arrested. To be honest, I don't think the police actually believed me fully, but who knows. Oh, and uh, to this day too, I wonder what would have happened if I hadn't have confronted him. Would I be here to write this story out, or did I put myself in unnecessary danger by doing that? I don't know. All I can say is that I'm thankful that I'm here. So about two years ago, my little cousin Jaden was four years old, and her family moved into a new house and started renovating it. Everything was fine too for a while until one day, Jaden out of pretty much nowhere, just started telling her mom how she could see two kids in a room. And if that wasn't creepy enough, the kids had no face. I guess it either looked smeared or just blank or something. And they also had no arms, apparently. My aunt was creeped out, obviously, but she kind of brushed it off and thought that maybe it was just imagination. My cousin started bringing them up more and more, though, telling more and more details about them. Well, one was a boy and the other is a girl. They told her that they wanted her to play with them. Jaden said that they were nice to her, but then they started to scare her. I would have been scared from the beginning, but whatever. But she would wake up in the middle of the night screaming because she was so frightened by them. My aunt didn't know what to do. My cousin would be playing, and when my aunt asks what she's doing, she would just say playing with the kids. I guess that they were only mean sometimes. And it still gets a little more creepy. So, besides there being two faceless and armless kids in her room, there was also an old man with a cowboy hat and cowboy boots, as she explained him. And this man was a mean man, and Jaden was very scared of him. She said that the two little kids were also scared of him, but the thing is is that the man was only allowed on the porch. He wasn't allowed to come inside since he was so mean, so as long as my cousin was inside, she felt okay. And one night, the family was eating dinner, and they started to hear footsteps outside on the porch. The door is right beside the table, and my uncle went to see if somebody was out there. He came back and said that he didn't see anything, but Jaden, with a very straight face, was just like, It's the mean man. He's standing at the door watching us, Dad. Of course, my aunt and uncle were freaked out, like, what the heck just happened? But then she said, It's okay, he can't come inside. That was a span of about six months, and a few months later they moved, and Jada never talked about the kids or the old man ever again. But honestly too, I'm not even sure if she remembers it, but I don't want to ask. I'm pretty sure that it was very scary for her at such a young age. And my aunt did some research about the house, and saw an old man who wore cowboy boots and a cowboy hat, used to live there, and actually died on the property. She could never find out about the kids though, which was really strange. My cousin has a few more creepy experiences too, so if you like this story, then be sure to leave a comment in the comment section below and I'll see if I can get them for you. But for now, I hope you enjoy. My grandma's house is really old. It was built in 1880, and my grandma grew up in this house, and she raised my dad there as well. My grandma and I were very close. She was a movie buff and passed that interest along to me. My sister was always more fond of my mum's parents, but they died when I was like 10, and they had been fighting cancer for like four years. So I didn't have many good experiences with them, which was kind of sad. But anyways, fast forward to 2007, I'm 17, and now my grandma is dying. Crohn's disease and leukemia have really taken their toll on her. My grandma passes away at home peacefully, thankfully. And my dad inherits this house and its payments. 
but unwilling to just give it back to the bank, my sister and her new husband decided to move in and make the payment so that my dad didn't have to. We all helped clean out all of Grandma's old stuff, except the basement. All that was really left down there, though, was some old canning and jarring stuff. My grandma liked to make her own jams and jellies. But eager to get out on my own, I moved out of my parents' house and in with my sister and brother-in-law. A couple of years go by, and my sister says that she sees some stuff and hears things at times. Neither me or my brother-in-law ever did. Mind you, I'm really not the supernatural, paranormal type sort of person, and generally I'm pretty skeptical. But eventually they get pregnant and decide the house is too old to try and update and baby proof. So they decide to move out. So now it's just me and the two cats. After some time my girlfriend moves in with me too. She's very superstitious and would often tell me that she hears things like footsteps from upstairs. We stayed in a small bedroom on the main floor because the upstairs of the house had the poorest insulation ever. And if it was cold outside, it was pretty much freezing up there. Vice versa in the summer as well. Being the skeptical person that I was, I always had some sort of an explanation for what she heard. Maybe it was Chaz. My sister's cat Chaz was huge. She easily weighed like 25 pounds and had a very heavy step for a cat. And was not graceful at all and she liked to sort of sneak upstairs. So to me, it just all sort of added up. But one night, while at work, just down the road a few hundred yards, I get a picture from my girlfriend, and super excited that it might be a nude. You can imagine my confusion when it's a picture of the cats, both on the bed with her staring intently at the doorway. The text reads, Someone's in the basement, come home now. I work so close to home that I couldn't even hit 60 miles per hour before I got to the driveway, but that didn't stop me from trying that night though. The house has two doors, the one in the front that we never used and the one in the back that we always used. The one in the back led into the house and into the basement though, so I used the front door and I went into the room, quickly retrieved my 45 from the closet and told her to call the police. It was a short walk from the bedroom to the stairs to the basement, but the combination of fear and adrenaline made it feel like hours to get there. All the while, I could hear this menacing racket downstairs. It sounded like someone was frantically searching for someone or maybe an animal that got in there somehow and was desperately trying to escape. The commotion was just so intense that I could feel it in the floor, in fact. Whatever was happening down there was super messed up and I did not want to be dealing with this. But I finally made it to the upper landing and the lights in the stairs in the basement were already on. So instantly, the animal theory was dismissed for... Something much worse. I thought to myself that if there's a guy down there, then I'm going to have to kill him. And this was definitely the worst nightmare scenario territory that I've ever been in. Suddenly though, the sound of a big shelf crashing to the ground breaks my concentration and without even thinking, I level my pistol down the hallway. I shouted, come out slowly with your hands up or I'm going to have to kill you. But my command was met with silence nothing. No sound. Maybe there was some sort of ambient noise, but my heart was beating so hard and fast that I couldn't hear anything else. A moment passes, and there's literally no other exit but the stairs, so I decide that aggression is my only option. So I hurry down the stairs and begin clearing the basement, ready to pull slugs into anyone that I might find. But when I do, there's just no one. It's not a big basement too, and there's really nowhere to hide. After a thorough sweep as well, I start noticing things. Weird things. Like, where's the mess? All that noise, but nothing's out of place? What about the shelf that I just heard crash to the floor? Still up against the wall where it belonged. And when I say nothing, I mean absolutely nothing had been disturbed. I've uh, never, I mean ever, felt so confused in my entire life. There's just no way with what I just heard that anything could have been intact down there, but here I was, and nothing. The adrenaline sapped from my body and turned my legs to absolute jello, and I just sort of slumped against the wall, bewildered at the side of the basement untouched. 
A couple of moments later and the police arrived. We all looked around in the basement and outside, but we couldn't find any sign of an intruder or an escape or anything. In the end, they tell us to call again if anything else happened, but it never did. As a matter of fact, I never experienced anything else ever again in that house. But I did move out about a year later in 2010. So, to this day, I still have no explanation for what happened that night. I don't necessarily think that it was a ghost or anything. I mean, like I said, I literally saw nothing. No voices, cold spots, no apparitions, nothing. But I definitely heard something impossible. So my friend Marissa and I hang out every now and then, and a couple of months ago, I went to see the newest Star Wars movie with her and her new boyfriend, John. Marissa's a nice girl, and John was a pretty dorky but nice guy. But we talked about the movie after we saw it, and he got really into discussing it. Honestly, I didn't even get any bad vibes off of him for that short of time that we met. But a few months later, I met up with Marissa, and I ask if she's still dating John. She says no, and then tells me why. And this is what she said, almost verbatim. Yeah, so uh, me and John were just hanging out in my room one night, just watching a movie or whatever. I was looking at my phone, and out of the corner of my eye, I see him fidgeting a lot, like really restless. He keeps shifting around and looking at me, so I ask him what's wrong. He doesn't want to tell me. He's like, nothing, nothing, but doesn't stop acting weird. So I call him out on it and ask him what's going on. And then he says to me, Listen, I have this fantasy about you. We'd had sex before, so I didn't think it was that weird. But then he said, I want to drag you out into the woods and tie you to a tree. Then I, I want to rape you and cut off pieces of your flesh. He started breathing heavy when he said this, like just talking about it was turning him on or something. And this was literally days before we were supposed to go camping with my family. But I kicked him out right there and then, and I told him to never talk to me again. But for weeks after that, I could see him driving past my house sometimes, and I was so scared that he was going to try and get me somehow. I know that people have strange fetishes sometimes, but this wasn't something that he wanted to do with her. This was something that he wanted to do to her. Anyone who's seen any true crime media knows a, a good warning sign when they see him. And I'm afraid that the next time that I see him, it might just be on the news. This happened around 10 years ago in the south of the UK. For reference, I'm a 28-year-old male... And at the time, I was working part-time at a fuel station on an A road, which linked a small village to a ring road into the nearby city. The village itself was quiet, high-end, and extremely expensive to live in. It was the sort of place that only had one chain store, and it was a weight rose. Everything else was either boutiques or privately owned gourmet grocers. So, as someone who has always enjoyed cars... It was always fun to see what kind of high-end luxury sports cars would adorn the forecourt on any given day. And this is where I met Michael. Michael was in his late 40s, dark hair, well-dressed, always wore Gantt or Ralph Lauren, or on his work days, tailored suits, etc. He was an all-round nice guy, exceptionally polite, which was actually a rarity as most of the residents of the surrounding area seemed to despise anyone who didn't qualify for the additional tax brackets. But we got chatting about his collection of vehicles or the watches that he wore one day. He'd always show up wearing some kind of Rolex and driving his Aston Martin, Range Rover or Porsche, so there was always a lot to talk about. I got to know that he worked in finance and the conversation got on to what I was planning to do with my life. I also wanted to work in finance and we'd always have these pleasant conversations until I left that part-time job in favour for taking up an apprenticeship role at my uncle's brokerage. But Michael is important to this story, and we'll get to why shortly. So something to be known about my uncle is that he's a man with a lot of fingers and a lot of pies, almost literally. And what I mean by this is that, as well as his brokerage and property portfolio, he also owned a few takeaways for cash flow purposes. 
I think we all know what that means, though. And as such, I would occasionally step in as a delivery driver when a driver would let him down. Luckily, my uncle also lived in the previously mentioned village, and the main pizza place he owned catered to the residents of said village, so tips were usually quite decent, and my uncle would usually throw me a few quid for helping out. Fast forward to summer of 2008 though, and I've been roped into dropping off a few pies at a property on an extremely prestigious road. The average house price here is well above 1.4 million, and I'm intrigued to actually get close enough to see what these houses actually look like as they're all gated and set far back from the road behind a shroud of trees and shrubs. So I find the place and buzz the intercom, when a voice comes back, sort of muffled, just saying, Yes? So I answered with the name of the takeaway, and the gates slowly open, and I make my way up the driveway to a very large mock Georgian home, complete with detached four-car garage, and that's when I see Michael's number plate. He had initials for his cars with the numbers 1, 2, and 3, and it was the same for his wife as well. I must admit, I was interested to see up close the sort of life this guy had, if I'm completely honest, especially as a young aspiring financer. So I exited my car, brought out the pizzas, and the double doors opened, and that's when I saw a very unfamiliar face looking back at me. It was a man, early 20s maybe, thin and shaved head, I can remember that he was wearing no shirt and some scruffy jeans and trainers. He was also holding something behind his back. Hey, uh, bring the pizzas through to the kitchen. I can remember his voice being hoarse and barely audible and with an accent that I'd never heard before. Nervously, I said nothing and I just looked at him, which made him sort of visibly angry. Bring the pizzas through, he repeated, more aggressive this time, and I finally responded. Where's Michael? This is Michael's place, right? It was completely true that in situations like this, your mouth goes completely dry and to always follow your gut. This guy was setting off alarm bells and telling every fiber of my being to just get off this property. Unfortunately, this is when it dawned upon me that it's a gated property and I was actually locked in. And then, things went from bad to worse. I distinctly remember the terror swelling up inside of me when he moved his hand in front of him to show me a large kitchen knife and uttered the words, run. And at that, I dropped the pizza into the gravel, left my car and decided that I'd have a better chance of survival by running down the driveway and lifting myself over the gates. They were the wooden type that had no decorative spears atop them luckily, but all the while I could hear his feet crunching onto the gravel behind me. I didn't look back and managed to pull myself up and over the gates and hurling myself onto the pavement beneath me. The adrenaline in my system still had me running for what seemed like hours but it was perhaps only 10 minutes at most until I was a good few streets away and I decided that it was now time to call the police. The police met me at the park that I was hiding at. One officer stayed with me and the other proceeded onto the property along with another patrol car. At first, I got the distinct impression that they didn't actually believe me or thought that I was up to something, but after my uncle arrived to pick me up and vouched for me being sent there to deliver pizza, the PC in question backed down. Upon their arrival at the property, they basically found nothing, just my car with slashed tires and broken windows, alongside of feces being smeared across part of the kitchen. There was food strewn about the place and also a needle found in one of the bathrooms, but... No sign of the man who threatened me. Michael and his family at the time were actually visiting family in Australia, I later found out. I never did go back for another shift at the pizza place after that too. But after this, I learnt that wealth and apparent financial security is just completely illusory. People are just people, and there are some sick and tormented people out there who will always find a way to carry out their twisted actions. And if anything, I've I had more encounters with crazy people since moving away from my council estate routes and into suburbia. So as a bit of a warning for you guys, this is going to be a very long one. I'll try to be as concise and organized as possible, but this is my third draft now trying to tell this story as neatly as possible. There has been so many different events and there's lots of details to comb through. But the reason that I'm sharing this is to 
well, share my experience. But uh, I guess also to possibly seek advice. This has reached a bit of a breaking point that has left me scared and ready to possibly seek help. Be it a spiritual medium, an exorcist, or maybe even a psychologist. Whatever the case, I believe that something is harassing myself, my girlfriend, my house, my family, and very importantly, my children. I don't think that this is a, a passive being, and every time something new happens, I believe more and more that this is possibly dangerous. But before I get ahead of myself, to give some backstory, I'm 26 and my girlfriend is 22. Her name is B, and B and I have been friends for many years, but we've only been dating for a little over a year now. I have children from a previously failed marriage. They visit on the weekends. After the divorce, I moved in with my parents to sort of restart and get back on my feet. I no longer live there, obviously, but I found this information relevant as it is where most of the story takes place. I often travel for my job, and this is also relevant, but not until much later in the story. So, to be frank, B, she sees things. She also hears things, and she has described many horrifying visions and sounds, and I knew that she had experienced this. And while I have also had my own experiences, I've never experienced anything like what she describes. I have never judged her for what she describes, and I have always kept an open mind. I do believe in the paranormal, but... I also believe in people needing psychiatric help from time to time too. I've always thought that B's experiences are one or the other as well, but as for which one, it's always been pretty irrelevant to me to be honest. I mean, I'm here for her and when the time comes that things reach a boiling point, I'm going to continue to be there for her too. It did not take long after we started dating for me to also share some of her experiences. They started off very simple, if that's the right word, and sort of easy to brush off. And not feeling right in certain parts of the house was pretty common. Feeling watched, seeing a shadow in sort of the peripheral of my vision. These are the kinds of things that we naturally write off as tricks of the imagination, just stress or what have you, even though we had both seen it at the same time. She says that the things that she usually sees are not of great detail, if she was to observe them, she would never be able to make out the details, nor make sense of the words that she hears. There's no facial details, clothing, anything of that nature. Now, I don't know if this just means that they're pure black, or if they're more of a blur or something. I'm not too sure, but she says that there are two exceptions, though. Two things that she has seen repeatedly throughout her life. And they are the only two things that she's ever been able to make details out of. She refers to them as the tub man and the nose guy. I believe it's best not to give them names, but this is what she calls them. The tub man she has seen in several houses. Her childhood home, a friend's house, and others. She describes him as sort of being skinny and lanky and wearing red shoes. She has never seen his top half too well, or his face, because whenever she sees him, he's already halfway in the tub. That's it. She'll see him crawling from the floor into the tub as if he was a spider or something, and she always catches those red shoes of his too. I want to say that she said that he's in normal clothes, but I can't say that for certain. The shoes, though, are what stand out the most. The nose man, on the other hand... She is only seen in her childhood home, and he's not so much a man as he is just a, well, a nose. I know, I know, it sounds silly, like some sort of a Cronenberg monster, a giant fleshy nose man that just looks at her and watches her, if he even has eyes. I'm not sure, but now, I know that this may not seem that relevant, but trust me, I've tried to leave out any details that I find irrelevant. And now... I'm going to delve into our experiences together. So, when you enter my parents' house, there's this living room sort of immediately in front, the kitchen to your left through the passway with the pantry and the garage door and stairs to your right. So left, kitchen, front, living room, right, stairs. Stairs going up and stairs going down. 
Upstairs is my sister's room and my parents' room. And downstairs is another sort of small living space, I guess. A bathroom and also what became mine and B's room. I'm going to mostly skip over all of the smaller experiences of us not feeling right in that smaller living space downstairs. But to be brief, until we had moved in, it had went mostly unused and shortly after we had moved in, I had realized that I really didn't like one particular corner of this room, and neither did B. But there were a lot of times where we would find the lights on in closets downstairs when nobody was home or in the middle of the night too. Sometimes when we would pass by to go to the bathroom, we would feel like something was rushing at us. But the first real experience for both of us that I can remember anyway, that really had us freaked out was well, while she was using the bathroom. So I was in the bedroom, which is directly next to the bathroom, lying in bed on my phone. It was about midday, I would guess, and she had come back into the bedroom and asked what I wanted. I wasn't sure what she meant by that, and had asked her to explain, and she had said that I was knocking on the bathroom door and was also asking to come in. She had said that it was locked and that she had asked me to wait. I had assured her that it was definitely not me and that I would have heard someone knocking at the door. She seemed a, a little bit frazzled by that and had assured me that it was definitely my voice. I jumped to us both showering one day and we had wrapped up and gotten dressed in the bathroom. She went to leave and said something is holding the door shut. I was obviously in disbelief, so I came over and turned the handle firmly but slowly and opened the door. It barely had cracked open too before, and I swear on my life, the handle very firmly twisted the other way in my hand and then pulled shut. I immediately swung the door open and rushed out of the bathroom to confront whoever this was, but of course, there was nobody there. This is almost a year ago now, but if I'm trying to keep a sort of chronological order, I believe this is what happened next. I was off at work and she was still in bed. She had heard my computer chair creaking multiple times. She felt like somebody was in the room and had pulled the blanket up over her head a bit and taken a peek. And she later described to me that a pale and gaunt woman was sitting in my chair, just smiling, smiling and staring at her. I don't remember if she said that there was something unnatural about her smile, but I believe that it seemed like a, a large smile from memory. But she also had eyes, not blank, not black. I don't recall what color her eyes were, as I'm colorblind and that detail didn't stick out with me, but my ears work and my eyes don't. Regardless though, I don't remember, though if I recall correctly, her hair was not black and it was a lighter color such as blonde or soft brown or something, long and sort of wispy. I wish that I had asked more about this woman to be honest, such as what was she wearing or any descriptive features. But B, she seemed very stressed out by this particular incident, so I didn't push for any more details. The reason this stressed her out so bad though was because she could actually see this woman. It wasn't like the other times, she was more like Nose Guy in Tubman. She could see every detail of her. But at this, she just turned back over, pretended to sleep, and waited for me to get home. But when I got into the room, I didn't see her. But before COVID had gotten too bad, and us being ignorant of how bad it was going to be, we had taken a trip to Michigan at some point. It was the whole family too, except for my sister. She had stayed behind and watched the house for us and fed the animals and stuff. We must have been gone for a week and B and I had gotten home the following weekend before my parents. It was already late at night and we were unpacking the car and she had ran inside. I kept unpacking but was suddenly overwhelmed with this really sickening feeling of being watched. It was worse than any other time before. And for some reason, I sort of kept looking to the side to the house that led around to the back of the house. I eventually grabbed some luggage though and then just sort of rushed inside. I had gotten inside and closed the front door. Immediately, my attention was drawn to the window in the back. I couldn't see anything there, but 
It just felt like something was looking right back at me, just out of sight in the darkness, and then I noticed, to my right, one of our cats was also sitting and just staring at the window. I tried snapping my fingers and saying her name. She didn't even flick her little ears though, she just kept staring. V had come back upstairs and we went outside to grab some more luggage. I had mentioned to her that I felt like I was being watched. I hadn't mentioned the window, but then she immediately jumped in and said that she felt like someone was watching her from the back window. Oh, but we hurriedly got everything inside and talked to my sister. We asked her how the week was and she said everything was fine. We noticed that she was in her room and while well, that makes perfect sense for any teenage girl to be sitting in her room, it just wasn't like her. You see, she always sits in the living room surrounded by all the animals and watches YouTube videos on the TV. So we asked her if anything seemed strange while we were gone, but we were very vague about any details. And she too had filled in the blanks, even pointing out that, even pointing to the same window. She said that she hadn't left her room any more than she possibly had to in the first few days because suddenly she felt like she was being watched from that window. We eventually grabbed flashlights and investigated the backyard, obviously to no avail, so we moved on. The next event seems strange to note, but just like everything else, bear with me. There's a reason that I'm taking a note of it. So, while I was staying with my parents, I unfortunately didn't have a bed for both of the children. But they both slept on the same bed. Really, it was sort of a pull-out mattress from the sofa in the downstairs living space. And yeah, it's not an amazing setup by any means, but I was trying to do what I could to just see my girls. I would set them up at night in that bed and give them each one of their favorite stuffed animals and... I'd let them watch TV with almost no volume, just to help them fall asleep and stuff. I'm aware that I really shouldn't let them have the TV on when they're sleeping, but I sympathize with the idea of being scared of the dark. As an adult, I still sleep with the TV on, in fact. Or rather, at least some noise like a fan or music or some kind of light. I really don't like dark on top of pure silence. Anyway... Maybe I'm a scaredy cat, but the point is is that I let the girls keep the TV on. Okay, so my youngest daughter is known to get up and seek out an adult. For no real reason other than probably comfort, I would guess. She doesn't come crying or scared or anything of that nature. She just kind of gets up, finds an adult and is like, Hey, can I hang out here too? I know, it's a bit weird, but not in so many words or anything. To which you usually just have to tell her that it's bedtime and to go lay down, sweetie. She'll go right back to bed, no problems. It's just something she's always done. So one night we had noticed that more than usual she just didn't seem to want to stay in her bed. Usually she'll just knock on the door and I'll send her back to bed. And this happened a couple of times, but the only time that she would go upstairs was if she heard someone else such as my dad. So... On this night, with her continuing to get out of bed, we wanted to know if there was a particular reason. So we had our lights off and we had cracked the door. We were keeping an eye on her and after a short period, we saw her get up again like normal. We didn't hear anything or see anything that would have made her get up and check if someone was there. But she walked over to the bottom of the stairs and just stared up the stairs. And she stared for a really uncomfortable amount of time, too. We watched her, unsure what to do next. Obviously, we knew that we needed to put her back down, but I think that we were just curious if she was going to, you know, turn around and knock on the door again or go lie back down herself. Now, there is, and I need to stress this, almost no lights upstairs. I mean, you can't really see anything. Everyone is asleep at this point. There's not a single sound. The only glow of light is not from the middle floor, but the upstairs hallway. But she starts climbing the stairs. It's a short set of stairs, mind you, but she's climbing it. She reaches the top, and B and I slowly open the door and come out. As quietly as we possibly could, we climb the stairs after her. She had went through the small passageway in between the pantry and the garage into the kitchen, and she's just standing there, 
in the dark. But we can barely see her, but she's definitely standing in the middle of the kitchen and staring into the blackness towards the corner of the kitchen by the window above the sink. Take note, too, that this is that same window above the sink. After an uncomfortable amount of time, we say her name and she bolts a bit, turns around, says hi and comes up and gives me a hug. Well, we asked her if something's wrong and what she was doing. She quite literally shrugs her little shoulders, points to the kitchen window area, and then puts her head on me. So, we take her downstairs, put her to bed, and... But we don't really sleep right away until that uneasy feeling passes. Again, trying to keep things chronological here. The next incident I can think of happened in the middle of the day while my girls were visiting. My girls are very young, but I'm not going to disclose their ages. I will say, though, that one of them is young enough to not quite make coherent sentences, but she does love to talk. The older of the two is no longer a toddler. She's a kid, and... Before I know it, she's going to be a teenager. But my dad, B and I, were outside putting together a swing set for my kids at some point. Which, if you've ever put one together, then you know that it's not as fun as using the swing set, that's for sure. It's actually quite a hassle, and it was taking a lot more time than we had thought that it was going to. Admittedly, I don't recall where my mother or my sister were, but I do recall that they were not there. So we had set the children up at the kitchen table with some kinetic sand and Legos. Figured that that could be some good messy fun for us to clean up after building this swing set. We would work on the swing set and go in to check on the children from time to time. I should note too that the children, they can actually see us from the window and we could see them. The window was even open at this point. But B suddenly described feeling sick to me, like something just wasn't right. So I asked her to check on the children and kept on the swing set. She went in and was immediately struck with an even worse feeling. She asked my oldest daughter where her sister was, and she said that she went upstairs with Momo, my mother. But my mum, she isn't home at this point. And even writing this out just makes me feel nauseous. Probably because my children are involved, right? But B ran upstairs and she described feeling a, a weird sensation. As she describes it, when she was talking to my daughter, she couldn't hear anything else. But as she reached the top of the stairs, she could very clearly hear my younger daughter screaming and crying that she wanted out. She tried the door and it was locked. She ran downstairs to get a butter knife and rushed back up, unlocked it, went inside, and she had to unlock my parents' bathroom door as well. She got her out and held her. She said that she had dried tears on her face, but she couldn't have been gone that long, surely. Well, but we were constantly keeping an eye on them through the window, even as we worked on this swing set after that. And B said that she could hear her yelling the whole time all of a sudden after she reached the top of the stairs. All the way back into the kitchen, she could hear her. But the strange thing is, is why could she hear her before? And why hadn't my older daughter heard her the whole time too? Not to mention that she knows how to lock and unlock doors, so how did she end up in that situation in the first place? Did she start to panic and couldn't get the door unlocked? I still think about my daughter saying that she went upstairs with mom. That one really freaks me out. I just feel like something is luring my daughter and... The idea of that woman that B saw, man, it just makes me feel sick. Uh, also, I just thought of a detail that kind of is important for later too. My parents have the master bedroom, of course. Uh, they have their own bedroom attached, and then from the bathroom is how you enter their closet. It's a sort of walk-in closet, and it's a very strange setup since it's somewhat of a series of doors, and it's kind of a bit bogus, but hey... It's not my house, and it's theirs. But some time passes, and my brother and his wife visit. Everything goes on normal, and it's a good time. We play some Animal Crossing, and we all hang out. They're getting ready to leave, and somehow spooky stories are brought up, and they were brought up by my brother's wife, I think. Just fun stories. But we start telling them about some of the things that we've experienced in this house, and they exchange glances in 
in almost cartoon fashion. My brother's wife then asked us to go outside. I was puzzled, but we went outside. She then elaborated that she was afraid that somebody was in our house and that she didn't want them to hear us, like a squatter in our attic or something. They began sharing stories of how bothered they had been in the past at this house too. These were all before we had moved in of course, some of which I don't recall at all and at the time I couldn't relate to them. Some others though were definitely similar to our experiences in that same closet and the same rooms would have their lights on with the doors closed and stuff and some doors would open or close when they weren't looking and three of the stories stood out to be and so... I'll briefly share those now too. So the first one was my brother was playing the new Star Wars game on his PS4 downstairs. His wife was upstairs. He had seen someone in the corner of his eye walk down the stairs and go to the bathroom and close the door. They had turned the light on as well, but after they had closed the door, he had assumed that it was his wife. But his wife was still upstairs, and when he had realized that, he went to open the bathroom door and nobody was in it. This is bothersome too because it's the same bathroom where B had heard my voice when I wasn't there and where something had turned the handle and closed the door when B and I were trying to open the door that time. The second one was when they were feeding the animals while the rest of the family was out of town. Again we didn't live there yet but my parents and my sister were out of town and they were feeding both dogs and both cats all weekend long too. When randomly, in the middle of the week, they could no longer find one of the cats. They had searched all over the house too, and finally they had gone upstairs and checked my parents' room. They had run out of options, but they hadn't checked it previously because they had no reason over the whole weekend to go into my parents' room. The cat was not in my parents' room, nor was it in the bathroom, but it was in that creepy closet. Now... You remember that setup that I mentioned earlier? I mean, how does a cat go through three doors and get stuck in the closet when nobody's home? This situation bothered me because, well, frankly, it reminded me of what happened with my younger daughter and it really upset me. It's probably also a good time to note that we constantly find the cats in the closets. Sometimes we don't even let them out. For example, when everyone is in the house and sleeping, but... Her and I, we play games all night. We would go to the middle level to get her food and we would hear sort of a door click open, look upstairs and see the male cat walk out of the towel closet very nonchalantly. This has happened three different times too, but nobody let them out. The door just opens by itself and he walks out. The third story from my brother and his wife, and this one is kind of simple, but... They were house-sitting again, as they often did for my parents. My brother was staying up playing some games on his laptop, and he had went outside to have a smoke. He was sitting on the bench outside, and this bench is right outside of the kitchen. Towards the back of the house, too, he had been there for some time, and the light from the kitchen window was shining across the ground. He said that a woman had walked into the window, and she was standing there in that window, and he said that it scared him because... He knew that it wasn't my wife. Like the silhouette didn't look like hers and he knew that she was asleep. And when he finally mustered up the courage to stand up and take a look in the window, there was nobody there. The shadow was gone and when he had went back inside he had confirmed that his wife had been sleeping the whole time. The reason this story bothers me as well is because that window it's the window where my daughter was staring in the middle of the dark of the kitchen that night. One experience my sister was a part of was when I was on my way to work. I got a text from B. She was still in bed, but all it said was, something is in the room. And a follow-up message about things getting knocked over and she's too scared to get out of bed. It's like 5.30 in the morning and still dark. I knew my sister would get up that early because, well, she's unhealthy much like us, so I called her and asked her to go check on me. She went downstairs and turned the light on, and when she did, she saw that my fan was knocked over and that all the stuff on my dresser was knocked over as well. This is all on the opposite side of the room where B is in the bed, but 
They eventually fixed everything and kept the lights on until the sun came up. There are only two more stories before we get caught up at the present moment. Both of these stories are the most recent and they've both happened in the past 30 days. But they both really concerned me because they both tie all of the events together but also make them all much harder to understand. As I said before, I travel for work, especially right now as the area of Indiana that I'm in is considered a red zone for COVID, so all the local work was pretty much shut down. But about a month ago, we were on our way to a job in Georgia, and there's not really that much setup for what happened because, well, it just happened very suddenly. We'd been driving for many hours already, but we weren't overly tired or anything. We always stop for naps in the car or something like that if we think that we're getting too tired on a long road trip. We'd been driving on the highway for most of the trip, but as we were getting close to the destination, the GPS had taken us off onto some sort of local roads for the rest of the trip, which we found odd because I didn't think Albany was that off the beaten path. But we had gotten onto a decent stretch of road though in the backwoods of Georgia on our way to Albany, but we still had a ways to go. Well, we both had started to feel a, a little off about the road that we were on. Uh, nothing too specific, but just that feeling that creeps up on you, you know? Realizing that I could always turn on my bright since I'm no longer on the highway, and maybe it would help us feel a little better to be able to see more of what's around us, I decided that that's what I would do. But no sooner than I had turned on my lights, I could see something on the side of the road. It was coming out of the woods and towards the road, I couldn't make out what it was and then we were passing it. As we had gotten closer though and I was able to distinguish it more, I can only describe it as a grey, even for my eyes being somewhat colorblind, human sized sort of fleshy shaking thing, not shaking like a bag blowing in the wind or fabric caught on trees. But besides, I had clearly watched it come from inside the woods and it was shaking like it was having a convulsion. Have you ever seen the Silent Hill movie? Remember that thing on the road that attacks the cop lady? Like a person gift wrapped in their own skin? It was like that, but less person and more shaky. Same color though. I instantly asked her if she had seen what I just saw, and she was thoroughly freaked out and described exactly what I had just seen. She said that it looked like the same fleshy material that the nose guy always was. Now, this part is strange to me though because it's a bit of a departure, I guess, from everything else that we've experienced. It seems entirely unrelated to everything else, besides her relation to the nose guy, I suppose, but it's important to me because it's the first unexplainable thing that I've ever seen for myself. Every story until this point has happened around me. I felt things for sure. Everyone's stories kept matching up, and I did feel something close the door that time, but this was the first thing that I had actually seen with my own eyes. But me being the stupid person that I am, I needed closure, so I actually turned the car around to go and check out what it was. When we did, there was nothing there. No semi-truck tarp caught on a tree, no amalgamation of small garbage bags creating a sort of larger, scarier garbage bag, and... No spooky Silent Hill monster either. I was a bit shaken though, but... On to the last one and the most recent story. So, I'm currently in Pasco, Washington. Another job. And it was, all together with naps and food stops, over a two-day drive. We made the usual rest stops off the toll road at those designated rest areas... Everything was totally normal, but at one of the rest areas, we had split and went into our own respective restrooms. Myself to the men's and her to the ladies' room. I had gotten out before and was checking out the snack machines, which, Wisconsin, why do you have cheese curds and pickles in your snack machines? Anyway, when she came out, I had taken note that she came out of the ladies' room on the opposite side of the rest area. I didn't think too much of it, but I did notice it. But she seemed sort of off, and we kept moving on. But thinking back, I should have asked her if she was alright. Rest areas can be shady after all. So we drove another day, and we were about six hours away from our destination. 
I remember looking at the woods next to us and remembering the thing that we had seen in Georgia. And I just got thinking about everything and I asked her if it was relieving that I had seen it as well. But my logic here is that she always questioned herself and the things that she sees, since she's the only one that had seen them. And I think that's kind of natural, right? She said that it was relieving in some sense that I had seen it, but it also terrified her because, well, it makes her wonder if everything else is in her head or if they're all real. She said that if they are all real, then she doesn't want to be alive anymore. Which, I know, it's super heavy, right? But I really don't blame her. I mean, if she's seen things like what I had her whole life, then... I don't know if I'd want to continue either. Anyway, I got thinking about everything again and asked her out of nowhere if she thought that the woman that she saw was what lured my daughter upstairs. And she just started panicking. I mean, scared for her life. She started crying and telling me, no, 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 don't talk about her. She was so afraid. She started looking in the back of the car to make sure she wasn't in the car. This idea and her panic really terrified me too, of course. And she told me through her tears that the previous day at that rest area when she had went into the first woman's room, that when she went around the corner and looked in, that she was in there. And apparently she slowly lifted her head above the wall of the stall and looked right at her. I assume with that same smile that she told me about before, but I can't say for certain. I mean, I didn't want to ask her. I just tried to calm her down at this point. She didn't want to talk about her or bring her up. She thought that even the fact that I had thought about her and mentioned her wasn't a coincidence. I reassured her though that it was, but it made me question it as well. I mean, we hadn't spoken about it in so long that it was very coincidental. But the reason though that it terrified her so much was because this is the second time that she'd seen her. Only Tubman and Nose Guy have ever been repeating, but now she is too. The idea that something like that could follow us out of state, man, it really scared me more than anything as well. And unfortunately, that's all I've really got at this point. I've spent pretty much all day just typing this out and trying to make it coherent for you guys too. I don't know if anyone is really going to get through all of this, but... I'm just kind of desperate, to be honest. I need to know if anyone has had similar experiences, if anyone knows anything about this, if we need a, a medium or if we need a, a psychiatric help. I, I don't know what to do. There are so many little details and bits and pieces that I've probably missed, maybe even important ones. But I've done the best that I could to try and explain everything I found important. I hope I haven't forgotten anything too big, but if you've gotten this far, then thanks for listening. Also, a bit unrelated, but if anyone is concerned about how much we travel during these times, let me reassure you that we very much keep to ourselves. We distance from everyone at stops, keep to ourselves at home, and my work is on oil tanks. The only people that I run into are on my crew. I can't provide evidence of any of the things that we've seen, only pictures of, like, animals, the house, points on the map, I guess. Pictures of the places that we've been, I suppose. Basically, I can back up every detail of my life. Except for the paranormal part, obviously. But I guess if it really was that easy, then everyone would believe, though. Wouldn't they? Anyway, thanks for your time, and please, do help me if you can. I'm a 14 year old male and I live in a pretty isolated area. I joined a gym a few months ago and since it was a walkable distance, I used to walk on my way to the gym and return in a public transport rickshaw. These vehicles are pretty compact and congested with a set of two seating rows in front of each other. My session ended at around 8 in the evening so it was pretty dark when I left. But I got into the rickshaw and I told the driver where I needed to be dropped. When the auto started, I realized that this very creepy looking man with dark circles under his red eyes is staring at me with a, an expressionless face. 
I shrug it off since these types of people are fairly common in my area. A few moments go by and the driver asks where I needed to get off as he had forgotten. I tell him again and this creepy guy says that he too will be getting off there as well. I must admit that I started to get a bit creeped out but still didn't think too much of it. I got off at my spot along with the creepy dude, paid the driver and started walking to the street that led into my neighborhood. I glance back and I see that this guy is now following me. But the creepiest part is that he was walking in an extremely sort of dead manner. That's the only way that I can describe it. I was getting scared at this point but felt relieved when I saw that there was a wedding taking place on my way home. It's an Indian wedding, so needless to say, it was very loud and very bright. I thought that he might go away in fact now, but he didn't. He just kept following me. As I passed the marriage lawn, it again became extremely quiet and dark, since the area that I live in is very empty and there's no street lights. The man is still following me. I thought to myself that maybe he lived around here, so there was a chance that he wasn't following me, but still, I was scared enough to start walking faster. But when I was three minutes away from my home, I saw that I was no longer being followed, so I assumed that he wasn't actually following me. But just when I reached the street that my house was on, I saw him running towards me. I nearly crapped myself, so I started running as quickly as I could to my house and started ringing the bell frantically. I looked to my side to see that he was just standing there like a statue, staring at me. Just as I was about to scream as well, my sister opened the gate, I got in, locked it, and the door. I told her what happened quickly and we both got on the roof of the house to see where he was. And we saw him walking away into the darkness. I left for gym early the next day and I came back well before dark. And this... It's the scariest experience that I've ever had. So I'm going to preface this by saying that I was incredibly naive. My best friend Jay used to work at a restaurant in a very bad area. She had moved there from our little suburb about 35 minutes away. I still lived in the suburb with my parents, so my street smarts weren't the best. This was three years ago as well, when I was 19 at the time. So driving around to visit friends was, and is, one of my favorite pastimes. Now one day, I decided to stop by the restaurant to see Jay, as I'd done it a few times before, and I was friends with all of her co-workers. My friend was busy, and she made me wait around with a few of the others for a bit until her break, then came to chat with me. At this time, I was very anti-purse and just kept a wristlet, a little wallet that you can keep around your wrist. And after chatting for about 30 minutes, I left the restaurant and walked back to my car. After driving for a while though, I noticed that I had left my wallet. So I texted Jay to tell her to grab it for me and where I'd probably left it. I already knew that there was a possibility that it was gone, being that I had left it in a busy restaurant in Center City. And Jay confirmed that it was indeed gone. My dad cancelled all the credit cards, but I was still holding on to hope that it would be returned, as I did have my ID in there. And the next day, I got a text from Jay, and she tells me that somebody had called the restaurant and said that they had my wallet, and that she had given them my number. I was really happy about this, but I also knew that I would have to meet up with a stranger, so I decided not to tell my parents. I didn't get a text until the next morning. The person said that they had my wallet and wanted to give it back, but never gave a name or a description. I didn't care though. I just thanked them profusely and asked when I could meet them. Hours later, they replied with an address and told me to stop by around 9pm. But the address was about, uh, I would say 20 minutes from the restaurant, which was also a really bad area, but didn't worry me as I had left my wallet right around there anyway, so I was pretty confident that this person actually had it. I got there around 9 and... This is when I started to get freaked out. Now, the house looked like it was previously a, a row home, but the one connecting it to the rest had been just completely demolished. The windows were boarded up and there were no lights coming from inside. The place was obviously abandoned, grass overgrown, weeds everywhere, graffiti all over it. You get the idea. 
But the door, however, was not boarded up and I could see that it was ajar in fact. I texted the number and the person replied a second later, telling me to come on in. It was early summer, so while it wasn't completely dark out, it was getting there and I would have needed a flashlight to see. So what do I do? Well, I turn on my flashlight of course. I get out of the car and I look around in hopes of seeing someone. Nothing. So, with phone flashlight in hand, I start walking up the dry rotted wooden steps to the front door. I crack the door open further, it's completely black, and when I shine my flashlight around, I can see that there's no furniture. I did think that I heard some quiet creaking from upstairs, which I thought was strange at the time. Why would the person text me to come in, but then be hiding upstairs? At this point, I knew that there was something wrong here. I was pretty scared, and I hightailed it back to my car. I should have pulled around the corner, but I didn't. I just called the police right there. Two policemen arrive shortly after and walk right into the house with flashlights. Then two more pull up. And they were inside for quite a long time. And then they came out. And with them, in handcuffs, are two skinny, scraggly, homeless looking guys. I only got a good look at one, but I do remember the guy had visible sores on his face and arms. I assumed that they were drug related. But as the cops walked them by my car, one of the guys looked at me with the angriest expression that I've ever seen. Two of the officers came over to talk to me and had indeed found my wallet inside. All the money was gone, but the rest was intact, which I was grateful for. The cops also rightly reprimanded me for being so stupid. I drove home after that, and I never spoke of it to my parents. Only recently have I told them what happened. And I guess I'll just never really know what those guys were planning. Was it just somebody messing with me? And I called the cops on two random homeless guys living there? I never got another text from that number, but I started carrying a purse after that. And I guess the weirdest thing, though, is that the cops, they never did find that phone. So a little bit of backstory. I work at a large cell phone retailer through college. The store was in a busy downtown area of the city, so we saw a lot of class diversity. And I mean everything from crazy tweaked out homeless people to business types on their lunch breaks. And because of this, they wouldn't let only females work at one time. So one rather slow morning, it was just my boss and I working. He was in the back office doing manager work stuff, so it looked like I was the only one in the store. And this guy comes in asking about our phone plans. As I'm going through the sale, he kept getting increasingly nervous. But by the time that I checked him out with his new phone, he was weirdly giggle smiling and fidgety. I thought that he might be nervously gearing up to ask me out or something. And as a socially awkward individual, I expedited the checkout process and quickly excused myself to the back office to sort of hide it out. I'm sure anyone in customer service can relate to not wanting to awkwardly turn down people who hit on you at your place of work. But he left eventually, and my day went on as normal. But then, the phone call started. I answer the phone. I say, hello, this is so-and-so, how can I help you? And there's just breathing. Hello? The breathing intensifies. My mind goes to the awkward guy early this morning, but I try not to jump to conclusions. Maybe it's a prank call? About an hour later, it happens again. I hang up immediately and tell my manager, who offers to answer the phones. About an hour later, my manager came out and says that someone's calling with a question, and they worked with me. And normal stuff. So I say, hello, this is, before I can finish, there's that breathing again. I motion to my manager, handing the phone back. He puts the phone to his ear, hears this creep and yells, don't call back here. In the next few days, my store started getting phone calls asking for me, always responding on not working and can't say when I can call back. And it was at this stage that I started getting walked to my car after every shift. Then, on day three, after a morning of multiple calls, this guy just shows up. Just one male co-worker and I working all day. 
He walks in with a to-go bag of food, important for later as well, and starts pursuing the headphones displayed on the wall. I motion to my fellow worker, Hey, this is the guy. This is him. Hero co-worker jumps up and helps the guy. Hey man, what's going on? He says. This guy was no longer a normal, awkward guy from a few days ago. He was calm, eyes opened, way too wide as well, creepy smiling at my co-worker. Not paying any attention to me, he says, how much for the headphones? Hero co-worker starts awkwardly keeping up his customer service, asking about which ones he may want and just all that sort of stuff. But this guy just stands there saying nothing, like a solid 20 seconds of not answering his questions and just a creepy stare. Then he turns and without a word just walks out. The entire time he wasn't looking at me, but once he leaves, my co-worker tells me to go back and call our manager. I'm a bit spooked, I'll admit. My manager says that if he comes back to tell him that he's banned from the store. Not even an hour passes and he's back to go food in hand. This time the store is busy though. I quickly explain to the customer that I'm working with what's going on and run to the back office. We have store cameras though displayed on a monitor, which I'm now glued to. I see Hero co-worker go up and talk to him. He just backs out of the door. This dude literally walks backwards 10 feet, never taking his eyes off of my co-worker, smiling. The co-worker comes back and tells me to call the non-emergent police number, and the police catch him sitting outside with his doggy to-go box. Co-worker and I are peeking out the window from behind the phone case display. The young police officer comes in and explains that the guy said that I asked him to buy me lunch and that we were dating. I informed him that I sold him a phone three days ago, that he was harassing me since then by calling the store multiple times. The co-worker backs me up on this, telling him about the creepy breathing. A while later, two police officers come back in to let us know that he's been banned from the store. The older police officer says, call back immediately if he comes back. This guy is apparently on probation for doing this to other girls. What? Well, the rest of the day goes by and co-workers and I are still on high alert. Close to the end of the day, we've settled down, sitting at the table, just shooting the breeze when he goes. Don't look behind you, but he's back. Just walk into the back room, alright? This guy is standing in the window, just looking into the store, just standing there. We call the police again, but he left way before they arrive. A police car parked outside the store for the rest of the shift. And after that, I thankfully never saw the creepy stalker guy again. I don't know if his motive was to actually date me. I think he just got off on scaring girls, perhaps. None of his actions were normal by any means, but... I wonder, what was in that bag? This all started about a year ago. I, a 23-year-old female, live on the second floor of an apartment complex and have lived here my entire life. The building is mostly comprised of families with young children and married couples. A lot of the families have lived here as long as my family has, so everyone sort of knows each other pretty well. There's only one apartment unit that isn't occupied by a family, but rather by a pair of brothers who just sort of keep to themselves. Now one day, one of their sons around my age appeared out of the blue. He was strange off the bat as well. He would always wear a sweatshirt with the hood up and would run through the apartment complex to get to his apartment. I'm not sure what his face looks like because he always had the hood over his face. He lived on the first floor, on the back side of the complex and would often get into his place by jumping through the window. He basically did everything in his power to avoid any interaction, but I didn't mind him because I never saw him due to my busy schedule. However, one day he just started sitting on the top of the staircase that leads to my apartment. This was strange too because his apartment unit was on the other side of the complex and on the first floor as well. I brushed it off though at first, but... It started happening every day after that. When I would come home from school, he was just always there. When my boyfriend at the time would drop me off at night, typically around 10.30 or 11, he would be there. 
Sometimes I would leave and come back hours later and he would still be in the exact same spot as if he didn't move through the whole five plus hours that I was gone. At this point, I told my parents and my boyfriend about it too and they became very vigilant. My boyfriend would park his car and walk me to my door every night that he dropped me off. Once he saw my boyfriend, he stopped sitting on the staircase as well and I honestly thought that it was over. But boy, it wasn't. He started waiting for me at the bus stop. The bus that I take home from school stops right across the street from my house, so it's a short walk. One day when I was getting off as well, I saw him waiting at the bus stop. Once he saw me get off, he followed me into the complex and sat on the staircase. He also started following me when I would walk my dog as well. And my parents were upset by this. My mum started letting the neighbours know that he was following me around. My neighbours started making sure that he wasn't bothering me or if I was alone that they would start a conversation with me until I got into my door. One day though, I got a friend request on Facebook from this guy. Mind you, he had never spoken a word to me, so how did he know my name, let alone find me on Facebook? My mum tried talking to his father, but they would never answer the door when my mum knocked on their door. So, I'm thinking, it can't possibly get any worse, right? I mean, he seemed harmless, I suppose, so I wasn't too worried. But, again, I was very wrong. Now, one day when I returned from my boyfriend's house, my mum told me that she had something to tell me, but she didn't want me to get too spooked. She proceeded to tell me that when she was walking towards the kitchen to get a glass of water, she saw something in the tree move. Now, our kitchen has a huge window that takes up most of the wall. In front of the window, there's a huge tree. And if someone were to climb in the tree, then you could see into our apartment pretty clearly. And well, you've probably guessed it by now. But when my mum took a closer look, she realized that my neighbor was sitting in the tree looking straight into the apartment. My mum called my dad over and when my neighbor saw my dad, he jumped out of the tree. At that moment, I felt my peace was stolen from me. We filed a police report, but when the police went looking for him, he was gone. It turned out, too, that there were snack wrappers and a blanket hidden in between the leaves of the trees. The police think that that wasn't the first time that he'd been up there in that tree. I couldn't help but wonder, too, just how many times that he saw me walking around, and I just had no idea. It's been about six months now, and I haven't seen him since. His father still lives in the complex, but there's no sign of him. The police haven't been able to find him too, so I have no idea what happened to him, but I really hope that he doesn't come back. This happened early 2018, the spring to be exact. It was just a normal gloomy day because it was spring and it was raining. We were inside all day pretty much. My dad was outside going to check the mail and out of the corner of his eye he saw a car all dented up in a neighbor's yard. So he got a neighbor and told him that there was a wrecked car in his yard. They thought that someone crashed and so they went to see if there was somebody in the car or someone was injured or something. No one was in the car, so they waited to see if the person in the car went to get someone for help or just all that ran. Like I said, it was pouring, so by the time the person got back, they're soaked. The person gets back and they make small talk. The man said that he just slid off the road and that he was fine. The neighbor didn't press any charges and they moved along with their day. But later though, about 15 minutes after this ordeal, we hear sirens. So my Dad goes back outside and sees that the police are at the mini mart down the road. Since my dad was a witness, he walked down there with my brother in tow. They get to the mini mart and the police are interviewing the store owners. They had been robbed by the man that was wrecked in that car. My dad gave an eyewitness statement and came back home. After this, I was afraid to go to sleep, thinking that he might come rob us. And so, many restless nights of sleep later, we're watching the news and see that the police had identified the man as the person who robbed the store. They went to court and apparently they found him not guilty, even though he did in fact rob the store. But later they took him back into custody and found him guilty of a second degree murder. 
I was glad that he was locked up, but we didn't know any details until later when it was on the news that he'd been targeting an old man for drug money. He continuously went to the old man's house asking for drug money, and if the old man didn't give it to him, then he said that he was going to kill the guy. And the guy also told the man that if he told anyone else that he would kill him. The old man told the police, and somehow the guy found out, and he murdered that old man. He went to jail, and as far as I know, he's still in jail, but man, it was horrible knowing that a murderer had been roaming our streets. I had gotten out of an eight-year abusive relationship and met someone on a popular online dating app. To be honest, I wasn't looking for anything serious, but just someone to go watch a movie or have a drink with every now and then. I had two boys and was happy living a peaceful life of my own after going through hell. So I met this guy who is just a couple of years older than me and he had turned his life around. When he was younger he used to be in gangs and drugs and now he was into working out and staying really fit and doing family stuff. I guess you can say that uh, I felt protected by him. He was a hard worker, self-sufficient, had a son, and he loved going to the gym every day. And I mean, I myself had kind of a crazy past, but overcame, and so but we seemed like a good fit. We would go to dinner, movies, normal dating stuff, but he eventually wanted to spend more and more time together, and I was having trouble giving up all of my free time for him, and he would get angry about this. Like, really angry. After being with a controlive and possessive person, this was obviously a red flag and after three months, I told him that I didn't want to see him anymore. He said that he needed to confess something to me though and he admitted that he was using steroids and that was the reason for his mood swings. He cried and said that he was sure that that was the reason and was even willing to stop if it meant that he could have another chance and I obliged but only under the condition that we remained friends. Things were okay for a while too. We saw each other maybe every other week I would say. And he started wanting to see me every week. To which I told him that I wasn't interested in being anything other than friends at that moment anyway since I wasn't ready for a relationship. He tried to talk me into giving him another chance but I just didn't find myself interested in him in a romantic way and so I insisted that we just be friends. In the end though, I just stopped talking to him because I got mad at his insistence that we'll still talk every day since he said that that's what friends do. He would always ask about my whereabouts and ask for pictures of who I was hanging out with and I told him that this is not what friends do, but he just insisted that he just innocently wanted to see what I was up to. Fast forward six months later though and I hadn't spoken to him at all within that time. I was happy and living my life, and on one particular night when my younger son was at his dad's, I went out to a local bar with some friends. And my oldest son, who was 13 at the time, was home alone, so I left a little bit early to make it home around 10pm. I lay down in bed and I go to sleep. So, a little info on my living situation too. I had been living in my condo for almost a year at this point. And we lived in a great, safe community, and I would leave my patio sliding glass door open quite often, screen closed obviously, to get a breeze at night, which was no big deal. And my bedroom was close to the patio, and my son would sleep in the loft that was closest to the front door. So I'm dead asleep, when I suddenly feel someone slowly sit on my bed. I'm laying in bed, wondering why my son would come and sit on my bed so slowly. He wouldn't. I turn around and it's not him. It's actually my friend laying down in bed next to me. I sit up and ask him how he got in. He's not answering me. He says, I need to talk to you. And I said, okay, when you need to talk to someone, you don't just sneak into someone's room. You call them, you leave a note for them, literally anything but this. All the while, I'm thinking to myself, I'm going to kill my kid for letting him in like this. And he said, I didn't have your number anymore. I needed to talk to you before it's too late. I didn't even entertain the before it's too late bit because I was livid at the time, but something told me to just keep my cool. So I sit up and say, look, I really want to talk to you too, but 
Yeah, not like this. Please just leave and I promise that we'll talk tomorrow. Call me tomorrow, okay? He gets up and walks over to my side of the bed and starts rubbing my shoulders and is slowly making his way to my neck. He says, do you really want to talk? I look him in the eyes and say, yes, I've been wanting to talk to you, but not like this. Please just call me tomorrow, okay? He stares at me while rubbing my neck and goes down my shoulders and then lets go. He then says, okay, and this guy proceeds to exit through my patio door and jumps my patio wall, which tells me that this is exactly how he got in. I freak out big time, check on my kid, he had no idea what was going on, locked all my doors immediately and I don't sleep the rest of the night. The next day I text him though and I tell him that if I ever see him near me or in my complex ever again that I'll be calling the police and to never contact me again. If you're wondering why I didn't call the cops as well, well, to begin with, I knew that he had a gun, so A, I was scared of being retaliated against for being a snitch, and B, I figured if I called the cops that they would probably not be able to do much or just let him out, and I was afraid of what he would do after the fact. Either way, though, he left me alone and I didn't hear from him for, like, years. I would say, too, that it was probably about four years later, I'm going through Facebook and I see his face in people you may know. I click on the picture and notice that it looks like a jail picture. You know, those pictures where the guy is clearly in a jail cell. So I sort of scroll down the page and in his most recent post is him posting his address for his family members to write to. It's a prison address as well, so I end up googling his name and sure enough, articles after articles, all with the same headline... Man arrested on suspicion of killing girlfriend. About two years after him and I dated, he allegedly shot and killed the girl that he was dating at the time. And I shiver when I think that that, that could have been me. And I feel like crap thinking if there was anything that I could have done to have stopped him, I, I should have done it back then. Even scarier though is that he only got 12 years for the murder. I'm a 17 year old guy currently living in Phoenix, Arizona. This incident took place around six months ago on an overnight trip into the Superstition Mountains, which are about an hour's drive east of Phoenix. I'm not going to specify the exact trail because I've been doing this stuff long enough to realize what happens when you post stuff on the internet. But whether it's a good trail, abandoned mine, ghosts, or whatever it may be, people come flocking and usually with a lot of trash and loud music. So, this particular trail I was taking was an 8 mile loop through a canyon. It was a pretty simple in and out overnight trip. I had planned to go with my friend, but my last minute cancel on his part left me on my own. So, with a packed bag and a car ready to go, I just decided to go on my own. Not leaving the house on time though and some trouble navigating rough forest roads, I didn't arrive to the trailhead until I would say around 5.45, which for those of you who don't backpack, this is a very big no-no. I still had a four mile hike until I arrived at my planned camping spot and it was getting dark quickly so I figured that if I moved quick enough that I could get at least two to three miles in before I had to find a spot. This strategy though left me hiking in a very dark trail on my own with about 15 miles of dirt road between me and pretty much anything else. Hiking in the dark by itself is scary enough though, especially for where I was and also being on my own like that. But eventually it got so dark that I could only really see where my headlamp was pointing and that's when I figured that I needed to stop and get a camp set up with only using the headlamp as my light source and trying to move quickly and I ended up in a less than ideal spot, but there were some burnt pieces of wood and the remains of a fire circle, so it looked like people had been there before, but definitely not recently. My first priority though was to get a fire going, so I scanned the area around me and was able to find some dry wood and I got the fire going. I got my tarp set up and I cracked open a can of chili mac that I had brought for myself and was very much looking forward to eating. I was feeling good too. 
my camp was set up and my food was on the fire. In fact, the feeling of uneasiness from the hike in had almost gone away, but it was still sort of there. Side effect of camping alone in remote areas, though, I thought. Now, to fully understand what happened, I have to explain how my camp was set up. So the site that I had picked was a small clearing surrounded by large pine trees with a trail about maybe 30 feet away to my left. When you're in the woods too and have a fire going, the fire casts a circle of light around it and everything on the edge of that circle and past it is pretty much pitch black. So I was sitting on the ground near my fire just eating my dinner when a small rock about the size of a marble I would say was thrown into my camp. I looked at the tiny rock in shock as I was positive that I was the only person on this trail that night. I immediately turned my light on and turned towards the area where I'd seen the rock come from, but due to the density of the pines and the brush, I could only see about 10 feet. I spent the next 15 minutes in disbelief as I was scanning the tree line that surrounded me, searching for what or whoever had thrown the rock, not daring to stray too far from my fire that in hindsight, actually offered me a false sense of security. But after sitting back down and spending the rest of my time on high alert, I was able to finally convince myself that I must have somehow kicked the rock or it had fallen from a tree or something. I went to sleep that night, not expecting the pure terror that was about to unfold. So I woke up to the sound of what I can only say are rustling leaves, barely audible if you weren't listening for them too, but... They were definitely there. Still in a bit of a sleepy daze, I listened as the rustling of the leaves got harder to hear as I assumed that whatever it was was moving away from me. I went to grab my handheld flashlight that I had left next to me when I had fallen asleep, but the more I looked, the more scared I got as I came to realize that it was just no longer there. I stood up in my sleeping bag and ducked out of my tarp and looked around and... I was able to see a light off in the woods. It couldn't have been more than 15 feet away, but it was definitely my flashlight laying on the ground in a pile of leaves. I'll happily admit too that this is one of the few moments in my life where I honestly almost crap myself. I mean, the flashlight that I had left sitting right next to me when I'd fallen asleep a few hours ago was now 15 feet away from me past the tree line in the woods. Well, I hurriedly slipped on my boots, clutching my knife in my other hand and keeping my head on a swivel. I weighed my options up, stay here and wait out the night or attempt the three mile hike back to the car in the dark. I figured though that whatever or whoever was out there with me was definitely going to have a better advantage if I was out on the trail without a light so, in the end, I just decided to stay at the camp and wait out the night there. And eventually, it came back. I could hear it walking through the woods. It was far off, but I could definitely hear it. And it sounded like someone leisurely walking. Like they were on a stroll without a care in the world. Sometimes it would walk far away and I would lose the sound of its steps, but... Then maybe an hour later, or maybe two, it would return, still faint as ever. This must have gone on for at least three to four hours too, until then I listened to the steps get closer and closer, until they must have been about only seven feet away from me. At this point, the fire had gotten very small as well, as I had run out of wood in my pile. The footsteps stopped though, and then everything just went totally silent. I sat there still for two hours, clutching a knife in my hand and praying that I wouldn't hear anything else. And I stayed like that until the sun cast just enough light that I could see that I was alone in my campsite. And well, you didn't need to ask me twice. I packed up my things and sped walked the three miles back down the trail that I had taken immediately. I arrived at the empty dirt road where my car was parked and nearly sprinted to it as I unlocked my Subaru, jumped in and drove and didn't stop until I put at least 20 miles between me and that place. Eventually though, I stopped at a gas station in Apache Junction to buy a Red Bull, but mostly just to see and talk to another human. As I exited the store, I was able to read something that I hadn't noticed before, 
that was written in the dust on the back window of my car. And it read, Sleep well? Question mark. A lot of weird things have happened to me on my various adventures through Arizona, but this, this one was definitely the weirdest and the creepiest by far. So I thought that I might share it here with you guys, seeing as this is sort of the place to do it. There are some seriously deranged people living in the Superstition Mountains. Of that, I'm certain. Do yourself a favor too, guys, and stay as far away from those mountains as you can. So I drove out to the Blackhead National Forest yesterday as a kind of day trip with my friend. We stopped at this spot with trailheads along a sort of creek and river. And this state has weird ideas of what a creek and a river is, so who knows what it actually is, but it was fun and things were going pretty great. We found a waterfall and decided to go a little off trail to see the tiny creek that fed it. Not far at all. But we were looking at this sort of itty bitty creek that was mostly swallowed by leaves and then I felt like I needed to look up the stream a bit, but not at the stream, just in that direction. And... I saw something about maybe 50 feet away. At first I thought it was a bird sitting on a table. It was very white or sort of light tan. Stood out amongst the grey surrounding of the bare trees though. And the moment that I saw it, I kind of froze. To be honest too, I felt like I needed to just turn around and go back the way that I came ASAP. I'm looking at it and realise that it's not moving at all. Like, it's completely still. The increasing feeling of danger and go-away vibes continue. I pointed it out to my friend and he said, Yeah, I don't think we're supposed to be up here. But I had to pee, so I went real quick while facing this thing just in case it was something that would run up with me. I started to reason with myself that it must just be a, a bit of bare dirt or dead wood sticking out from something or weird or something. But I just couldn't shake this feeling that I was getting. Anyway, we head back down the edge to the trail and I have that feeling like there's something right behind you that's going to get you. Sort of like when you run up the stairs in the dark when you're little and you just feel like something is sort of on your tail. Anyway, as a note, I always pay attention to when things are extra silent around me in nature. I know my presence can make things go a little bit quiet because, well, technically I'm a predator, but this is the subtropics. The woods are never dead or silent in the winter or any time, basically. It's just sort of no longer obnoxiously loud. But I noticed that when we were up there that I couldn't even really hear the waterfall that went off the edge about maybe five feet away from us. No bird sounds, just nothing. And these trees are tall, so often the birds just go up to the top branches and yell their alarm calls to each other. But there was none of this. I don't even recall seeing any life the entire time that I was out there. No fish, no insects, no flies, which was really weird. I even gently dug into some of the water spots to see if there was anything there, because I think that stuff is cool, but there was nothing. Very weird. So we're walking away from this waterfall and as soon as we go around this rock where we wouldn't be able to see the waterfall anymore if we turned around, I didn't have that something is right behind me feeling anymore, like at all. We had to turn back around though because we were a few feet off trail and it kind of dead ended at the sort of drop off back down to the trail. When we go back down around the rock, I instantly feel it again. But this time, it's immediately in front of me. That's where this waterfall is too. I don't feel it from the waterfall per se, but from the ledge above. It's like someone dangerous is watching me from up there, but I can't see anything. Anyway, I know it's super weird, but we go down the trail and we just continue on. The whole way, I hear branches snapping and stuff. Sounds like something human-sized at the smallest, but it's coming from the ledge above that overlooks the trail and the river creek that it winds along. Bad vibes the whole way. 
we see some sort of structure along the trail that had a fallen tree that had taken it down. So my friend says, okay, we got to at least go that far. And I agreed because I didn't feel bad vibes from that spot. But we pass it and there's another creek leading to the river thing. Just like the one with the waterfall, that is. The trail winds back a bit up the stream and then comes back out. I suppose it's a way for them to build smaller bridges maybe and there's less erosion up there or something. I say I don't want to go any further though because I don't like the vibes back there. He agrees too and we kind of hang there for a minute. But then we hear people or something off in the distance. I don't feel right about it either. Granted, I had some sketchy experiences with property owners years ago on a river in northern Tennessee, so I think maybe that's why I feel weird. I'm trying to talk myself down from the concern, I suppose, but I still have my guard up and I'm staying situationally aware, that's for sure. I'm kind of keeping my head on a swivel while still enjoying the beauty of nature. So we start heading back and I'm getting an increasing feeling of this thing is going to get us or me. It's still on the ridge line coming back with us, but... It's like slightly ahead, I think. Branches cracking, sounds of water. Not near the waterfall too, but trickling and splashing like that when I didn't hear it there on the way in. I keep looking back up because I just know that there's something there, but I can't see anything. The creepy feeling though keeps getting worse and worse and we eventually pass this waterfall and there's some old ladies at a picnic bench. They say hi, I talk to them briefly about their dog Lee she has her dog and says hi and he does a sort of cute bark I love dogs but I didn't stop this whole time that I was talking to them because I just didn't trust anything that was happening at that point I even for some weird reason questioned whether they were real or not the dog seemed normal enough though anyway I keep going and I'm feeling a little bit better like this thing backed off a bit but still, I want to get the heck out of there, and we get back to the trailhead where we parked, and my friend saw the first sign of life. A fly, finally. Also, there were finally bird noises, which I was very grateful to hear. We get into the truck and leave, and I just felt like it was a movie. Like the camera would zoom in on the ridgeline as we were leaving to show something or someone was watching us. But anyway... We drove around a few more places, checked out a small lake, and made our way back eventually. I didn't feel right still, and I just felt really drained. Like, just exhausted from the hike, which was a very intense one. But, like, mentally and emotionally drained too. Somewhere along the trip too, I sort of looked at the time, and when I looked at it, I could hardly believe my eyes, because now, it was way later in the day, and... There's just no way that it should have been. Anyway, it was a, a really weird day and I'm not sure what the heck that was or, or what happened and why we lost all that time. But if anyone has any ideas of what happened or what that thing was, then please do let me know. This happened when I was 13. I'm a girl as well. And in the 8th grade and the middle school that I went to was about a 15 minute walk so not very far. For context too, my older brother and I, we grew up in East LA in a small house that had a metal gate and both in front and back doors had a black metal screen door and a wooden door too. During the day we would always leave the wooden door open and have the black metal door closed and locked. Well, except this day. That day, I came home from school and had about an hour before anyone else would be home. I was really thirsty, so I rushed inside and grabbed a drink, sat down at the kitchen table, which was about 10 feet away from the front door. I then heard the metal gate open and was surprised as no one should have been coming home that early. I got up to see who it was and saw an older man, probably in his 60s. He had short white hair and a long white beard, he was wearing an ACDC t-shirt, torn jeans and sunglasses. I remember thinking too that he looked a lot like Santa Claus but dirty and creepy. Well, he knocked on the metal screen door and asked if my parents were home. I was a dumb kid though and said that they weren't. 
he had a huge smile on his face at that point and said that he collected donations for needy children. I said sorry, but I didn't have any money. He said sometimes children donated old toys. I said I didn't have any old toys to donate. He insisted that I must have some toys that I didn't want anymore. He was beginning to creep me out a bit and it was then that I noticed that I hadn't locked the door when I came inside. I tried to keep my cool as I slowly and very carefully moved my hand, locked the door. I kept him talking so that he wouldn't notice and a minute or two later he just wouldn't leave so... I decided that I would pretend to check for toys and then say that I didn't have any so he would hopefully leave. I told him that I would go and check and as I turned and took a few steps down the hall, I clearly heard him yank at that door trying to open it. I didn't want him to know that I had heard so I just kept walking down the hall and into a room. I didn't have a cell phone and the only phone in the house was in the kitchen. I thought about what I should do and decided to stick with my plan. After about two or three minutes, I walked out, hoping that he'd left, but nope. Creepy Santa Man was still just standing there. I told him sorry, but I didn't find anything. He sighed and said, alright, he would check another time. He then left and walked across the street. I watched him from the kitchen window, peeking through the blinds, as he just stood there staring at my house for what must have been at least another 45 minutes. My brother and a few friends of his finally came walking down the street, and as my brother came inside and his friends kept walking down the street, the man chose to walk around the corner and then just disappeared. I told my brother what happened and he walked outside to look, but by that time creepy Santa man was long gone. When my mum came home, we told her what happened and she called the cops, but they said to call back if he ever showed up again. Thankfully, too, he never did show up again, but it was a creepy experience, to say the least. You're in South Africa. We're in lockdown right now. I meant to travel for work to Santa Barbara, but since we're under lockdown, we can't really go anywhere. So, I'm an entrepreneur with a tech startup here though, and since I travel mostly, I make use of the Riga's co-working space for a hot desk or meeting room. It's quite flexible, and there's always coffee and pretty girls coming in and out, so that's always nice. Since COVID-19 broke, however, I saw Regus as a public or corporate office, with many people coming in and out. Therefore, I was now stuck with no office. But a buddy of mine told me that he has an entire unused area at his house behind some offices. I would be alone. I'd have my own kitchen, lounge, TV, bathroom, everything. But the catch? I would have to park on the road. So let me quickly explain the way the road is. It's a wide, steepish road with a massive park and a zoo on the left. With three entrances and parking and houses and businesses on the right. I use this road quite often to go to Florida Road, a popular bar and food district, but there's only street lights on the houses and businesses side. As there was a red line or no parking line alongside the road on the right and the left, I had to park outside the park. So I parked in the first parking nearest to the building that I was working at. It wasn't near and I still had to walk a few meters, but this story takes place one night before the lockdown. So I had a call with a company in Denver, Colorado, which I had to start at 6pm, SAST. It went well, and I decided to pack up and leave. I wore formal shoes and carried my laptop on my back. Being paranoid, before I left, I looked on the CCTV before opening the gate, and I didn't see anyone outside. I then proceeded to buzz myself out, lock up and walk out, and uh, I don't know how to, but... In the time that it took for me to walk from the building to the gate, a man appeared. He seemed drunk or high maybe, and just sort of hanging around against the fence on the side of the road my car was, wearing a hooded sweatshirt with the hoodie down, torn brownish jeans and sneakers. I started walking and looked down, keeping track of him from the corner of my eye. Mine was the only car left, so I would assume that he knew that it was mine. And as I got closer to the car, I noticed him starting to walk out toward me. I ignored it. 
He was still walking diagonally, trying to cut me off. He then said, as he was about five meters away now, Hey, let me help you with your bag. Now, I had a comfortable laptop back on. I was walking hands-free, and yet he asked to help with my bag. In South Africa, car guards usually help you with your grocery bags and expect a 5 or 10 czar tip. But not this guy. This guy knew what I was doing, where I was going, and what I was carrying. To make matters worse as well, he had his left hand in his hoodie pocket and was now walking much faster. And then, it all went down in a split second. He suddenly lunged at me, but being a football player, I feigned left and I went right. In that split second too, I thought that if I ran to my car, which was still another 10 or 15 meters away, I would have surely not made it. I am fast, but fumbling with my keys, opening the door, getting in, I wasn't confident. So instead, I made the decision of jumping the fence into the now dark park. I made it with one leap over, albeit slower since my laptop backpack kept bouncing on my back. But as soon as I hit the ground, I took my laptop bag off, held it in my hand, and I just went for it. I looked quickly for a dark spot to hide, so I ended up behind a massive tree in the park. There were a few of them, but it was the only one that didn't have a light hitting on it. I heard him running and slurring his words and saying something like, just give me the bag. But my car was on the other side of a tennis court, and if I could get to the tennis court, sneak around that, and then run to the car... I think that I would make it. But there was a lit open space between this tree and the tennis court, and he was running straight through that space, so I watched the angle of him running and slowly rounded the tree to keep myself out of his line of sight. Quite honestly too, I think him being high or drunk or whatever helped me immediately here because as he ran straight past and toward the other side of the park, he didn't seem to get me. When he was a distance away, which could have been more than 20 meters I suppose, I made a break for it. Not being quiet anymore now too, I pushed away every branch and leaf which he heard and turned around and saw. I burst around the tennis court, stupid because I could have just went back the way that I came, I know. But I turned around and saw him yelling and running back at me, stumbling every now and then too, but picking up the pace and then actually gaining on me. And now I could see that he had a knife and it was out. I puffed my way up the hill, opened the car and jumped in. I locked the door with my laptop on my lap and started my car. And when I looked back at the darkness, he was just gone. He must have slunk back into the park when I was out of range, but where he went, I don't want to find out. I skidded, drove the heck out of there, and I won't say that I won't work there again, because I would. But maybe next time... I'll Uber it. So this happened when I was 15. And during the summers, I lived with my dad in a super small town close to the Navajo Reservation called St. John's. It's a town with a, a lot of nice people, most of which from rancher or cowboy families. The town is in the middle of the desert, the closest city being like 45 minutes away. Now one night... My friend and I decided to prank one of our other buddies. It was dark outside, like pitch black dark. There are barely any street lights in the town and as a result, it's incredibly difficult to see without a flashlight. But after we pranked our friend, using window paint to write a funny message on his car, we began walking back to my friend's car. As he started opening the door, we heard something close to us on our right. We turned our heads and pointed the flashlight towards the place that we heard the noise, and about a hundred feet away was a creature so foreign that my friend and I became just paralyzed with fear. The kind of afraid where your whole body tightens up so tensely that it actually hurts. This thing looked like a dog, but it was the size of like a small tiger. It was dark brown with matted fur and pitch black eyes. Imagine the werewolf from Harry Potter, but less humanoid. And it was walking when the light hit it. It moved just so strange as well, almost as if it was unfamiliar with its body, like it was trying to decide whether or not to walk on four legs or two. It slowly turned its head towards us, its eyes narrowing on ours. It stared at us for what seemed like forever, before it jolted its head into the air, 
and just screamed. Not like your noise that you hear an animal make, but like the screech of a woman. And the creature's screams caused our paralyzed bodies to jump back into reality as we realized that we needed to leave ASAP. We jumped into my friend's car and sped away to his home, and the whole night we just sat on his bed, trying to double check with each other that we actually saw and heard all of that. When morning eventually came, I went home to my dad's house down the street. I was scared to tell him what happened because one of his only rules is that I wasn't allowed outside after 11. And when I told him, I expected him to say that I was seeing things. But to my surprise, he actually believed me. He grew up in the town and lived there almost his whole life. And my dad told me some of his own encounters with skinwalkers, which was kind of comforting for some weird reason. But my dad is incredibly religious, so he believed the skinwalkers were Native Americans that worship Satan, but and now that I'm older, I realize that that's kind of racist, really. Sort of in the same way that the Indian burial ground horror stories are a bit that way, too. But anyway, that's what happened. And as I've grown older, I talk to my siblings and other people in the town about what happened. It turns out as well that lots of people, my family included, have had their own encounters. I'm not really sure what to believe, but I know that I saw what I saw. When I was about 14 or 15 years old, my friend was having a birthday party at her house. It was only just girls until my boyfriend and another boyfriend of my friends attending the birthday girls party insisted that we leave her house and walk to the local high school closer to her house to meet them so that we could continue hanging out and have some fun with them. It was around 2 in the morning when we were walking down a straight main road that eventually led to the high school when all of a sudden this hillbilly, probably 40 something years old guy, drives past us, slows down, stops and backs up to me and my two friends that went on this walk. He stops right in front of us, gets out of his car, walks up to the three of us and asks us what pretty young things are doing out so late like this. Me being the most clever or perhaps the most stupid and brave, replied to him with some bullcrap story about how our friends were having a party and they started drinking so we got uncomfortable and wanted to go to my house for the rest of the early morning and after I told him that, he just stood there with his hands in his pockets, sort of eyeing each of us up and down, all whilst looking back at his truck a few times. My friends and I definitely knew that he was trying to figure out which one of us would be easiest to grab and throw into his truck. I was the smallest of my two other friends, mind you, and he kept making eye contact with me over the other two friends. He just stood there, eyeing us for what felt like forever, but was probably more like a couple of minutes. He eventually asked us if we wanted a ride home, or if just I wanted him to take me home. We replied that we were almost home anyway and we didn't need or want a ride, and then he just stood there eyeing us up and down again for another minute or so, deciding what to do I think, and he eventually got back into his truck without saying a word to any of us. When he drove off and was far enough away for us to start running, we jumped the small fence lining the high school and we ran across the field to the tennis courts where we were startled by my boyfriend, my friend's boyfriend, and another guy friend of ours. We told them what just happened and we walked over to an alley that was at the end of the school that led back to the sidewalk and the main road that we had just been walking on. I heard some screeching tires and a car speeding as fast as they could back up the road and we saw that... It was that guy again that we had just encountered, speeding directly back to where me and my friends were just walking. He stopped his truck, got out, and was walking around, looking like he was searching, most likely for my friends and I, I would guess. But we all hid in some nearby bushes as he patrolled the sidewalk up and down, and after a few minutes of searching for us, he got back into his truck and sped off in the opposite direction from which he came. We all ran to the other side of the school and took some inner neighborhood streets to get to my friend's boyfriend's house to make sure that he couldn't find us if he was still on the hunt. We assumed, too, that he came back around as fast as he could because he finally made the decision to pick one of us up and take off with us to do as he pleased, or whatever he had planned. 
And all I can say is that I thank God that we dodged that creep that night. Because it could have all ended very differently. So I'm a sheriff's deputy in a fairly busy county. And along with this job comes the unfortunate familiarity with what a decomposing human body smells like. To me, it's very similar to an animal carcass, but with a much more sweeter odor. Not sweet in the sense that I enjoy it. Heck no. That smell normally means a bad night for me, in fact. And another gruesome memory to add to my catalogue of things that I would rather forget. But anyway, with that out of the way, I'll get to what happened. So last night I was patrolling a geographically isolated area of the county, which is a very large and sparsely populated place. Having completed the hour-long trek to the northwestern county line, I began driving through the mountains back towards civilization. About 25 miles from town, or the closest semblance thereof, I hit a straight stretch of highway through a wide valley. Since the weather was nice, I had my windows rolled down, and as I passed the entrance of an old logging road, that familiar smell of sweet rot suddenly just filled my car. Not just a whiff as well, but a cloud of it filled the cab as if there was a weak old human corpse sitting in the front seat next to me. It was all too familiar, but this time there was something else that I just couldn't place. It lingered for a few moments and then went away just as quickly as it had entered. Realizing what I had just smelled, my heart sank and I pulled to the side of the road. I told myself that it was just a dead animal in the ditch and that my mind was playing tricks on me. I turned my car around and drove slowly back towards the logging road. The closer I got, the smell became stronger and I grew more certain that I was about to find uh, another body. Holding onto a shred of hope that I was wrong though, I parked my unit on the side of the highway just before the dirt road. I radioed to dispatch, told them my location and that I would be out of my unit for a moment. I didn't say why to avoid an awkward disregard on a possible body on the side of the road, but I shot my flashlight into the ditch and into the encroaching briars and weeds as I walked closer to where I believed the source of the smell was. Once I was a few yards away from the dirt road, I saw the opening of a concrete culvert going under the highway. At this point, the smell was nearly as strong as it was when I had first passed it. The opening of this place was about, I would say, three feet in diameter, just large enough to hide a body inside. I cursed and held my breath as I leaned over and shined my light inside. But when I did, it was just uh, an empty tunnel stretching the width of the highway. Somewhat relieved, I must admit, I just sort of stood there and looked around. It honestly smelled as if I was standing on top of whatever was emanating the odor, though. I searched around the brush for a moment, but I didn't find anything. Thinking now that the origin may be on the opposite side of the highway, I crossed to the other ditch to continue searching. But as I walked away from the other side of the road, the smell grew fainter. I stopped at the opposite end and peeked inside just to double check. But the odor was nearly gone at this point. I stood up and I checked my surroundings when I heard a crack in the brush behind me and the smell just engulfed me and was even stronger than before. Thinking for a moment that the wind must have shifted, I froze when I realized all of a sudden that the air was dead still. Whether it was fear or something else, a shiver went down my spine. In the distance, I saw headlights coming down the highway, and as the car came near, the motor seemed to move away further into the bushes towards where I had heard the crack. The car stopped, and the passenger rolled down the window and asked if I was alright, I lied and I told him that I was. I thanked him for checking and walked briskly to my car as they drove away. And after that, I just got the heck away from there. Once I was able to get cell service, I called my friend who was patrolling the opposite side of the county. I explained what happened, trying not to let off that I was spooked. And once I was done though, he paused for a moment, then asked about the unusual hint of something which accompanied the smell. He asked me if it was sulfur, and I put two and two together, and I must say that it definitely was that sort of sulfur smell. I asked if he thought that I had found a demon in the middle of nowhere, to which he responded with a concerned yes. 
A little background on this guy as well. He is the son of a missionary and has been around the world a lot. He has seen, or rather smelled this before, and told me that it was a very concerning experience. I'll admit too that this spooked me even more because his responses were very out of character for him. Also, I know from experience that this community is very resourceful and provides helpful feedback. So, what the heck do you guys think happened? Has anyone had anything even remotely similar occur to them? There's always the chance of a very scientific explanation, I know that, and I hope that one is out there that could explain it away. If you're familiar with my previous stories, then you know that I've had some other encounters in the past, which included an encounter with a possible possession. I'm open to any advice or guidance, though. I mean, I know how to fight criminals, but an evil spirit? Not so much. And to answer a question that I know is coming, yes, I will be going back there tonight when I get off work. So I'm quarantined with my mum. We're both avoiding going out when possible because we're both compromised, so we just sort of take short trips for any errands that we need to complete in order to not go stir-crazy. Today she needed to get some gas and we needed a few groceries too, so we both went. We saw my cousin at the gas station and after I went to one of the pumps, I said hello while my mum went to pay for her gas. After she paid, I started pumping the gas and... We all just sort of stood there chatting for a moment, and when my cousin returned to the car, a man came out of the gas station. He was balding, unkempt, a patchy short beard and old glasses, the kind you see on high school photos from the 80s. He was wearing a sort of a tropical shirt with a notepad and a pen in the pocket, and dirty car keys and a tan jacket. He stopped at my cousin's car and talked to her. She's kind of small, so I stood there watching until she got in the car safely, and I heard it start. My mum and I were pumping the last bit of gas into the car. Both of us didn't need to do it, but we were both just glad to be outside for a moment. The guy walked over to us while she was finishing up and said, Are you having fun? We just kind of glanced at each other, and my mum said, Uh-huh, and swatted me to make me go to my side of the car. I didn't go though, I didn't want to until she was in the car herself, and then the guy turned to me and said, are you having fun with your granddaughter? As if he were trying to make a joke, but his facial expressions never changed. I just kind of gave him a, a bit of a blank stare and said, that's my mum. I squeezed between him and the bumper and moved to my side of the car. He followed closely and said, I just came here from Michigan, I've been here for 10 years. I got in and held onto my door. He stared at where I was holding the door and then at my face again. I was giving him the blank stare and said, well, that's nice. And then my dog stuck his nose out and began barking at this guy. He's a 15 pound Yorkie and usually sweet but sounded like an angry guard dog while he was barking this time. Is the dog having fun? The guy asked. I held onto the door tighter and said, I guess so. Uh, have a nice day. I closed the door quickly, locked it, and my mum just drove off. My cousin drove after us. She had been watching the entire time as well, waiting for either us or the guy to leave. But my mum and I both remarked that the guy was super creepy, and we both thought that he may have been trying to jump in the car. I'm really glad that I went with her today.